So what can we do with this? If we know that mechanical energy is conserved, which is to say all the forces acting are conservative, then we know that mechanical energy stays the same. So we can pick any arbitrary point in the process. Here I'm imagining points 1, 2, 3, and so on. Once we know the total mechanical energy at any of these points, we know the total mechanical energy at all the other points. Since potential energy depends on position, and kinetic energy depends on speed, if we know something about the total mechanical energy, we can figure out something about the positions and speeds. What sorts of problems is this useful for? Well, first of all, it's useful if you already have some information about potentials. Two examples that I've shown here are MGH, gravitational potential, or 1 half kx squared, the potential of a Hooke's Law spring. Also, you have to know in this system that there aren't any non-conservative forces acting, because of course, if you want to conserve mechanical energy, that has to be the case. If those criteria are satisfied, then we can do things like find the speed at different positions, or find where something stops. That would be where we know the speed is zero, for instance. This is a very powerful technique, but what it's not so useful for is finding times. This idea of work and forces and potentials tells us information with respect to position, not time. So here's an example of a simple conservation of mechanical energy system. We're showing a person pushing a crate off of a height. Gravity is going to be speeding it up as it goes down. Eventually we can use that to do work on the coconut. So gravity is exerting a force mg on the object as it drops a distance h. So the work done by gravity is mgh. The gravitational potential energy decreases by an amount mgh. The kinetic energy increases by an amount mgh. The mechanical energy is conserved. Potential energy goes down by an amount mgh. Kinetic energy increases by the same amount. A slightly less simple example is this shown here of having a sled go down a hill. In the initial part of the process, where one child is pulling the sled up the hill, that's a non-conservative force outside of the system of the sled plus the rider. Then there's the descent phase, where the sled is going down the hill. That we can just look at as conservative forces. We, of course, are neglecting friction between the runners and the snow, which usually can be considered quite small. At the top of the hill, the energy is all potential energy. The kinetic energy is zero. So that's just mgh0, h0 being the 20 meters, at the height of the hill. As the sled descends the hill, potential energy is going down, gravity is doing work on the sled, kinetic energy is going up, and then this section is going back up the hill a little bit, the potential energy is going up, kinetic energy is going down. We can very easily calculate what the speed must be at this position. The new height is 15 meters, the difference in potential energy between 20 meters and 15 meters tells us the increase in kinetic energy from that kinetic energy and 1 half mv squared, we can figure out what v1 has to be. So this total energy at position 1 is the same as the total at the initial position. It continues to pick up speed, losing gravitational potential energy as it goes down the hill. Finally, at the bottom of the hill, position 2, total mechanical energy is still the same. Potential energy is now zero because we've just defined our zero as the bottom of the hill. So all the energy is kinetic energy. The kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill is equal to the potential energy at the top of the hill.